All right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second seminar for the year. Um, we're gonna go through McMansions tonight. So a couple of housekeeping things. I muted everybody, um, so try to stay muted. I, I think I made it where you cannot unmute yourself. So obviously I'll have to unmute our guests tonight, but we had a couple issues last week with uh, some people unmuting themselves. And then obviously if you have a question, I'll go through that. Uh, the best way to, you know, have discuss um you know participate have a, a share a question things like that um i'm going to shoot over to here so this is our uh you guys probably can see my screen or hopefully if i did this right um this is our seminar schedule for the rest of the year so we did the water rescue one last week that's available uh, on our youtube channel um some very good information there uh as then tonight obviously mcmansions um, next, uh, not next week, the following week on Monday, I believe that February 5th is, um, I'm doing a high rise seminar, um, uh, with, uh, a good friend of mine, captain in New York city, Anthony Zaccaro, uh, we're, it's going to be a little bit more on the, um, we're definitely going to have tactics and some of that stuff, but he has, um, you know, he has, a industry background and in standpipe design, things like that. So we're going to get a little bit more into the weeds of that as well um and code some of that stuff so i don't want to say that it's going to i don't want it to sound like it's going to be boring by saying we're going to talk about code but um some of the things uh we're certainly going to get into you know why we might set up a hose attack package one way versus the other based on some of that stuff and really uh, he does a lot of consulting so that's uh, some of it's going to be you know what he can offer um if you're if you have some high rises coming into your district or your town or city, and you're looking for some information on that. Um, and then we're going to get into the RIP pack. Uh, so Don, if it, assuming Don does well tonight, I'll bring him back for that, um, as well as, uh, you know, Paul Bubart from uh, Connecticut Custom Fire. And that's going to be um, a wide swath of information, both from the technical side, more with Don, more from the tactical side with Paul, and meshing that together uh, there's been a lot of changes with the RIP pack and SCBA in general in the last couple of years. And so I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Half the time, Don and I are texting during the day, like this post makes no sense. This person has no idea what they're talking about. And, you know, in the end, that falls on us. That falls on the manufacturers for not educating um, the end user on that. And then uh, February 27th, we're going to do a kind of promotional prep type lecture. Um, I've gotten some shit for doing it at 10 a.m., but it, it's 100% geared towards uh, career firemen. It's not a volunteer thing. Um, so we'll have that recorded if you're working that day or you have a side job or whatever, that's fine. But both of these guys, uh, other than being good friends, did really well in their promotions um, or promotional exams this past year. So I just wanted to get them out there and uh, you know help you out. Um, so our registration's on our website a week prior. So please don't email me a month ahead saying, hey, I want to register. We do, we put the link up there a, a week prior. And then I'll put the links up here for the YouTube videos, as well as, um, you know, it's on our YouTube channel as well. Eventually, this will get deleted. So, so without further ado, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn it over. And again, it might take me a second. I have to unmute uh, Jason, uh, Don, and Jeff. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves. And uh, then we'll get into a little bit about what McMansions are, uh, why we should or should we be treating them differently. And then uh, and then I'll take it from there in terms of how we're going to set up the evening. So um, Jason, Don, and Jeff, are you guys able to unmute yourself or do I have to do it? I guess you can't answer me. So oh, Don got it. So that's good. And Jeff's good. And Jason's good. Excellent. Yeah. So Jason, uh, you're just the first person in line. So uh, please introduce yourself. Um, and guys, you know, last week we had uh, water training resources come in. So guys that I'm friends with, but not within Flash Fire. All three guys tonight, whether Jeff likes it or not, all three guys tonight are uh, very deep indebted with Flash Fire. So all my guys that and Jeff's not, but I'm I've been trying to recruit him. Um, all guys that I've worked with, you know, teaching for years and are excellent resources, especially for what we're talking about tonight. So Jason, please introduce yourself and uh, you know, a little bit about you. Jason. I don't know if it's me, Dan, but you're getting choppy. Yeah, it's freezing well. up. Okay. 
Hold on one sec. Well, Jason, he'll, he'll be like cable hookup, man. You got to pay yeah, for right. this. Jason, <laughs> you, Jason, you want to introduce yourself? I'm going to see what I can do on my end. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I got you. I can hear you now. All right. Go um, ahead. Yeah, Jason Baraka. Uh, I've been with Flash Fire for probably about four or five years now. Uh, I work in Greenwich. Uh, I'm a lieutenant there. I've been there for 10 years. And I started uh, my career in West Haven in the West Shore Fire District. I was about there for about five years. And um, yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, Don Scarpetti. Uh, work in Wilton. Been there eight years. I was in Naugatuck for close to three before that. Uh, I've been in the construction trade for uh, whatever, 15 plus years, I think. Um, so tore houses down, built them back up, uh, been around, you know, engineered lumber and all that kind of what we're going to get into tonight. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right. Uh, I think first and foremost, probably like a, you guys in here that I've, uh, you know, been to a few of these fires and it just, I've had that feeling of being behind the curve, you know, and it's a shitty feeling. I don't like it because these are, uh. These are a little different animals, I think, but um, hopefully we can just shoot the shit, throw some things back and forth, and um, you know just kind of get a better understanding of them. Um, Jay Cloker, been in Greenwich for a while, and I worked in Wilton as well with Donnie, so I worked with Jay and uh, Don as well, and uh, that's about it. Cool. So, um, can you guys hear me? Okay, am I? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I'm not sure what was going on. So. Um, so start off tonight uh, after the introductions, um, what is a McMansion, right? And I kind of went both ways. Do we want to start with, are these fires different? Or are they not? But I'm going to start off with what is a McMansion? So um, before I turn it over to you guys uh, on what your definition is, because I say that because there's no there's no formal definition out there, right? If you Google, if you um, go on NFPA or, or IFSTA or whatever, there's no formal definition. And so I did what the only uh, what the only responsible thing to do is in order to find that definition. And I went on Urban Dictionary. And so I know I was talking to you guys about this a little bit and it's a little bit funny, but, um, you know, there's a lot of different variety of definitions out there about what a McMansion is. The overall kind of thing was a uh, large open open floor plan, more suburban. Um, I didn't know that it was kind of named after McDonald's almost, um, where, as you can see, bland, tasteless, and generic, much like the food uh, <laughs> at McDonald's, as well as uh, popping up all over the place. That was a common theme as well. So start, I'll go back to Jason. What is your, what, what do you think of I don't know if you can yeah, I don't know if you have a uh, slide. It's not showing up. Oh, I did. Uh, Were you something? Can you see my screen now? Yeah, you showed your you shared your screen, but nothing popped up. No, it's oh, like can you see it now or no? Mm. It's it's not that important. I nah, basically like said it. what it was. So, um, nah, it's it's just... look, look at Urban Dictionary. That's where I got my definitions from. So, I'll uh, turn it over to you guys. What do you consider to be a McMansion? You hear, you know, someone says, "Oh, we had a fire in McMansion" or whatever. What do you consider that to be? So, Jason, I'll start with you. You want to start with me? You said Dan, I couldn't. Yeah, hear. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. All right. So um, prior to this, we had done some research kind of looking into uh, creating a McMansion class. So I kind of have a little bit more um, of a Google search behind me. And kind of a good thing that I found was uh, more from the realtors. They're looking at a McMansion. They're saying anywhere from three to 5,000 square feet. And then a, uh, a full-on mansion is going to be anything over 5,000 square feet. Anytime I pull up on a house and it looks just larger than the, that normal two-story colonial I start kind of running through some different checks in my mind if it, if it gets into that big mansion or mansion level, because we're going to talk about a lot of things tonight that you have to do differently and you have to kind of act accordingly when it comes to it. But that's kind of more of a formal definition based off of square footage. Cool. All right. Uh, I'll shoot over to Jeff. Uh, I just 
changed something on my router. So I think I have much better signal now. So hopefully there won't be any uh, lags. So Jeff, what do you consider a McMansion? Um, bro? Uh, same, and like James said, we kind of get desensitized. I think this whole Fairfield County area, um, you know, you, the, the norm now is four or 5,000 square feet, four or 5,000 square feet for a house, you know? So yeah, you usually got the McMansions and then you got the mansions. And I think, um, the problem is with the McMansions is unless you realize, and for me, it's like three things, I think, both from like a first in officer and and like a, a command and control from an IC standpoint, everything takes longer. You know, one, you got your lapse burn time, but two, the time to get things done, whether it's recon, putting a line in place, you know, the area, not just the square foot, but the, the cubic feet, you know, these 10, 12 foot ceilings and then, you know, your water supply, um, that's always an issue, but yeah, any, anything over 5,000 feet, it's, it's, these are really, yeah, it's residential occupancy, but it's like in a, on a commercial footprint in terms of size and, and just everything. You don't have the luxuries to be lucky and get by where you wouldn't a regular residence, you know? So I think you kind of got to step back and really take hold and be uh, deliberate in what you're doing, and what you can't do. Don? It's not even for me, not so much a size thing. It's just, it's a big house that's, you know, built within the last 20, 25 years, engineered lumber. Um, some may have the open floor plans. Some may have, you know, multiple access points where it's, you know, a grand front entry thing. You know, maybe there's a side kind of door with a you know, patio and all that stuff. Um, and just, it's big, you know, and it, it Again, not def def definitive on the size. It's just the way it's built. It's the, they're all kind of the same uh, skin and bones, if you will. Um, it's just they're they're kind of thrown up. Um, they've got different features of you know open floor plan, big entryways. Um, sometimes even like stairs. Like there's always been the atypical. Um, in the construction world, you know, stairs follow stairs, stairs take a big portion of what that, uh, that footprint is. So you have to follow them. So you have, you know, stairs on top of other stairs, but in, in McMansions, that's not always the case. And, but sometimes that, you know, that big entry coming up, uh, in the front door, there's not stairs underneath. You got to go find those basement stairs. So. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is, you know, nothing really makes sense in those floor plans. You know, you're always, you're always checking off as you're, you're, moving into some type of structure and you're kind of playing in your mind. Okay. This floor plan makes sense, whether it's a split Cape colonial exactly. but with, with the so I'm, gonna, it, I'm just going to interject one. Cause we're going to get into this in a minute when we talk about the okay. construction. Um, but I just want, how, I guess, how, why do you have to treat these differently? I, and just in a sentence or so, why a private dwelling is a private dwelling. Why do these need to be treated differently in your opinion? Me, anyway, I just think, yeah, because one, they're all shit material. It's all lightweight. So that elapsed burn time. If you don't see it blowing out at you and you're chasing something, you, you know, you don't have the time that you did before. And if you get turned around or you get messed up, it's not as easy as making a left hand, a left hand turn and finding a window. You know, mm -hmm. you can get disoriented pretty quick. You get into some of these basements. I mean, or even just some of these bigger places. It's it's it could be an emotional event for you. You know, and, and, and a couple of things you guys said, um, and then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes, uh, the desensitized part. And, you know, I, I think that that's definitely going to be a theme, like when Tony and I do our high rise stuff, like that's what we go to. Um, whereas some towns, you know, a McMansion might be the once in a career, or once every five year type fire. Whereas I would say most of the fires you guys go to are probably in McMansions and um, or straight up mansions. Um, so again, it's just about getting the uh, knowledge from the people that that do it often. And I think uh, that's really what hopefully you guys are going to get out of tonight. So one of the things that I kind of set and, and we talked about it earlier, um, the way I was kind of setting up tonight just to make sure we cover everything. And I didn't mention this before, but guys, I have the chat on here. Um, so any uh, questions that you guys have, please just put into the chat. It'll come to me. And then I can ask um, our panelists that if it's something that you want to ask, um, you know, 
out loud, if you will. Um, you know, you can, I think there's a thing you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but most guys like to just put in the chat with their questions and then I can ask the panelists, if you will. Uh, but basically the way I thought tonight would go, um, because we want to cover, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is we're just going to go to go down the 13 points of size of coal as well. Right. Uh, and I think that some of them we're going to spend more time on some of them. It's going to be a one sentence thing and that's it. But I think that'll ensure for tonight that we kind of cover everything that we want to do. And so you guys were already kind of started getting. And if, if anyone's not aware of what coal was wealth was or is, um, can you see my screen now? Is it playing? No, no. It just shows that you're sharing it, but doesn't show the document. There you go. Oh, you okay. I don't know what happened. So coal as wealth is a very popular uh, size up kind of acronym. Again, not that you're getting off the rig and doing all 13 of these points, but that these are things that you can go through to kind of think about um, on scene of a fire. So uh, construction, occupancy, area, life hazard, water, Auxiliary system, street conditions, weather, exposures, apparatus and personnel, location, time and hazards. So I don't want to spend, you know, some, uh, as I said, some of them we're going to spend a lot of time on, some we're going to spend a little bit of time on, but I thought that that would be a decent layout for kind of how we want to discuss tonight. So construction, I'll turn this to Don initially because you were talking about a lot of that. So both from the types of materials to the layout to voids. What are some things that you see when you hear or you come up and you see McMansion? What are some things that you kind of think of that you're like, oh, shit, OK, I got to check this now. So we all know there's building codes and, and fire codes and all that good stuff. The problem is that's like the minimum and uh, they're not really an invested interest uh, in firefighter safety or anything. It's just, you know, building them cheap, building them fast. And then the biggest problem is, you know, they're tailored to the, the you know, whoever wants to build the house. So, you know, like we're saying before, you know, Cape, Ray's Ranch, you know, all these houses, you kind of know, okay, if the kitchen's here, you know, dining room's here, living room there, bedroom here, and all that good stuff. McMansions, there is no rhyme or reason. Um, with that, in the, you know, uh, materials they're using, it's, uh, if you haven't heard of uh, TJIs or LVLs, it's all laminated engineered lumber. Um, and basically think a TJI is a, a wooden I-beam, which is essentially, you know, two by four top and bottom. And a, uh, just think of a sheet of OSB in the middle. Um, they're very strong on paper, um, as well as the LVLs. You know, we crazy stuff taking out, you know, bearing walls, putting beams in um, to give that open floor plan. Uh, the only problem is they burn really, really well. And if you've been to a flash fire class and we're using OSB, it's the same kind of stuff. Um, so that burn time, uh, and I'll put it in the chat later. There's a couple of links to some websites that did testing. They're talking, you only got six minutes of burn time before they start to fail. Um, and then, you know, we'll get into like, you know, the basements. I got some pictures. I mean, these things are wide open uh, basements, you know, could be just an eight foot ceiling. It could be, we've been in them where there's, you know, 15, 20 foot ceilings, you know, all concrete to the bottom of these wooden I beams and they're unprotected. So that a basement fire to me is, is bad, especially if it's been rolling. Um, Cause yeah, we're going to get, lot. we're definitely going to talk about basement fires a little bit later. And uh, okay. I have um, some good resources on that as well. So. Um, all right. Um, Jeff, what are some of your big, takeaways on construction wise uh same thing right it comes back to like what dunn says mass you don't have the mass you don't have the time and usually we're getting you know it, it's not that it's delayed per se but you're rolling in and and those wherever that fire is that location that could be chewing away at those joists or those uh trust joists or tjis you know so it ju you just everything nowadays is lightweight and like i said with these bigger structures and fire grounds you don't have the luxuries of being able to you know kind of go like you used to without checking up and thinking wait a minute where is this fire and how long have i been in here you know and then obviously you know the, the raised ceilings that can either mask conditions you, you may not get those get that feedback that you're used to so you could be kind of cruising along thinking all right i'm good and you're not you know as well off as you thought 
And then when it does go south, it, you know, that, that really maxes your writ and things just snowball. Yeah. We're de definitely going to talk a lot about that tonight. Uh, Jason, would anything uh, that they didn't mention on, on the construction side of things? Yeah. Just so some more of the unique challenges that come with these homes, we see not even the main matches, some of the mic matches um, elevators that are being built in residential elevators that we have. Um, we're seeing them from either being retrofitted or starting from the original construction. And that obviously adds a challenge, um, not only in identifying it, if you're in a smoke condition, but also then if we have to search that looking for people who might be trapped within there as well. And then with money comes a lot of different things, indoor pools, um, basically saunas we find, gymnasiums, all, all things that as you open a door, you think might be a bedroom. And next thing you know, you're in a completely different area that's confusing. The layout doesn't make sense. So like Don said before, the construction doesn't make sense most of the time from how we are and what these, what these individuals are specking these homes to be. Um, so it's definitely something that um, you really can't go with the traditional search patterns or whatever it may be, because nothing is, is going to really lead you down that same path that we're traditionally used to. And that goes off of, if we look at a split level, I can tell you where the kitchen is. But if I look at a McMansion, there's there's no rhyme or reason to where things are. So just more of those unique challenges that we see. Um, we tell our new guys, if, if you're forcing an outward swinging door inside a house, um, you better be sounding the floor when you open it, because there's a high probability that that's going to be an elevator shaft, whether you're going to go to an elevator or you're going to be going into an open shaft if it's on another floor. So just some more kind of uh, just the unique things that we see. Yeah. So bottom line, open floor plans, lightweight construction and no way to tell from the outside where one thing is or what the layout is. So absolutely. So uh, occupancy and, and I think, I almost skipped construction and, and kept it to the end because I knew that there would be so much to talk about there. So I don't think we're done talking about the construction per se. Um, and I'm sure it'll be integrated into some of the other stuff uh, as we talk. And if there's any other thoughts that you have at the end, we'll certainly get into that. But I just want to make sure we get through all of the other stuff as well, especially once we get into some of the um, case studies construction plays a huge part in that. So we'll definitely be touching more on construction guys. Um, but again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. When we talk about occupancy, uh, I, I think, I, I dare say 100% of the time, these are private dwellings, but 100% of the time they're private dwellings. But I don't think that tells the entire story, right? So uh, we're certainly not getting multiple dwellings or shelters or hotels out of these for the most part, but occupancy uh and i'll just read it up here. residential commercial industrial could the zoning use describe this pre-incident plan be outdated or violated some of that stuff maybe not but what do you think of occupancy and and i, I think it's going to be bedroom location for the most part but what are some of the things that uh when we talk about occupancy or where people are located that change when you have these tremendously large size structures um oh jeff go ahead well, I think one unique factor is you you can have some pretty crazy game rooms where kids hang out either up on the you know the top floor, and there, there's been all kinds of crazy little cubbies that you can cut through to get to another kind of grand room on a top floor or, or down in the basement as well. So yeah, obviously bedrooms high priority at night, but you know if you check up when you get there with whoever the homeowner is, if you can get a good head count then from them. And maybe it's animals, you know, that you're going for. But at least you can kind of check down a little. But yeah, I would say a lot of these, yeah, they have they have pretty opulent game rooms, play rooms, hangout areas for kids. So that's a high priority as well, you know. And a lot of it is going to be a targeted search, right? You get there and hopefully someone's there to greet you and say, hey, this is where to start. Because if you just try and head in the front door like you normally would on a cape and find the stairs and start an oriented search, it's going to – it's going to take you a long time. So you really got to kind of get good information and target your search. If it's, if it's for victims and then try and find that fire as well. Don, it's just you, big of a space to kind of go yeah. through methodically. Don, what are your uh, occupancy? So I'll just tell you just, it was recently, uh, I don't know if it was Jeff, me and a, a captain went to an EMS call um, and we're, you know, trying to gain entry to this house you know the 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 woman who called Ellie couldn't get to the door whatever uh but long story short find, come to find out that her son was upstairs and he had no idea she called 911 
and we were you know banging on the door and everything. So the people within the house, it might be a family of four. They don't know where anybody else is in their own family. So it, it it's another one of those challenges, you know, you know, we, and we do it at the, you know, uh, the school grade level for fire prevention, as silly as it may sound, but, you know, make sure you have a meeting place and make sure you know where people are and all that good stuff. So, well, Jason, I, I know you won't have any EMS stories or EMS from the stories. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> but um, I, I'm thinking, and, and I could be wrong, but tell me, uh, you know, you have a large house. The kid says, Hey, I want my bedroom to be in the basement or I want it to be here or there, or you have a, uh, you know, a live in babysitter. I forget what the term for that is, or whatever. Au pair. Au pair. Au pair yeah. Thank you. Um, we know the term. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, <laughs> you know, does that play a part into where people are located in the house, things like that? Yeah, without a doubt. And also, you have to remember the mentality too. When when you get to some of these homes, if you're asking them if if everybody's out, they might be in referring to their own family. Some of these large homes have on-site staff, chefs, au pairs, nannies, um, or if it's during the day, just workers. So it's getting accountability of not only the families, but also if you can get a foreman or whoever is part of that crew that might be doing work in the basement, maybe they pause the fire, but getting accountability for all those members too. Like Don said, these houses are so large, something might be occurring in a basement that the, the homeowners on the first floor or second floor have, have no clue is going on. So getting that information from them and, and making sure just that quick additional second, uh, hey, is there anybody else working here or anybody else that lives on the site might trigger them to then speak up and say, oh yeah, our, our pair, our pair lives in the basement. And then once you take that extra seconds that, like Jeff said, a VES or VEIS, however you want to say it, operation might be or probably will be the best bang for your buck. We operate with three-person crews. I know a lot of other departments have less, so you really have to make a, a decision on what your move would be to get there as quick as possible because these homes are just so large. And, and to go in that front door where most people are taught that is not usually going to be the best point of access for you to get to where you have to go. So and we'll talk about with the line of duty deaths, but taking the time to get that information and to do a full 360 might save you so much time down the road because it's going to put you in the right position to get into that bedroom or to get into that area that you need to go to. Cool. Um, I'm going to move on to area, and this is definitely going to go back into construction. And uh, obviously, that's what we're talking about tonight is area. So how big is the involved area? What is the size of potential spread? those types of things. So how does that change? Obviously we know the size is, is different, but um, I think, and again, you guys touch on whatever you want. My thoughts are compartmentalized versus open um, as well as, you know, different floor plans that you see that could create advantages or disadvantages. Um, so what are some things, you know, I'm, I'm leaving that open-ended for a reason. So Don, what do you think when, when you think, area and again you've you i think you've taken a test before obviously you know but what what do you think about mcmansion with areas is that for me well your name's don so yeah i think i got a little <laughs> one sorry <laughs> uh so area it's 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 the floor plan is big and then like we say sometimes they're um you know wide open you know there's there's no partition walls or anything which you know screws you up uh if you're going to do a search so like jeff and i always talk jeff's my captain at work so we've always talked about you know if we have to search you know it is going to be beneficial to bring in a large area search search rope um some of the other things with you know fire spread uh i saw in the chat somebody had asked about laundry shoots and it's that's a good point you know a lot of these places do have all the nice amenities um, and just trying to find in, you know, 5,000, 6,000 square foot house, you know, where, you know, you, it, the worst part it always is when there's a light haze or a light odor and you're just trying to pinpoint it. And now it's, it's that whole time frame of trying to pinpoint it, trying to figure out where it is. And if it's a fire, you know, the longer you, uh, aren't finding it the bigger this you know potential problems growing 
Um, and then with that too, you know, we can get into it further down the road, but uh, you know, we talk as, as far as uh, fire spread and travel, um, you know, it's always these houses are the, the nicest things, you know, and, and they're loaded with whatever. Well, you know, you've got pipe chases for lack of a better term, which, you know, yes, fire code says you're supposed to caulk all these holes and whatever. No plumber, no electrician is caulking every hole. So trying to find that, you know, one spot that's going up, you know, we've got problems trying to get, uh, you know, CO issues solved because there's just, you know, room after room after room and all that stuff. So. Yeah, and I'm just going to, um, from the fire dynamic standpoint, one of the things that concerns me, and, and I, I, we have 4,000 square foot apartments, they're just on the 19th floor, you know, but one of the things that we look at that uh, is definitely concerning is the not just the open floor plan, but the fact that it, it's almost in a circle, right? So you could potentially be and I know you got to take the class to get all the information, but in terms of pushing the fire, right? It's not that you're pushing fire with the stream, but if you're not getting water under the fire, you're moving the air behind it. And now you could potentially be pushing the fire and having it wrap around you. Um, and, and that would definitely be a concern of mine if, if with some of these open floor plans and knowing that, you know, the house moves all around it, itself. So I'll, I'll move to Jason on that. You can tell me I'm full of shit, um, but I know you obviously teach a lot of the flashover stuff. So when I talk, when I think of area, that's some of the things I think about. What What about you? Yeah, so the, the fire dynamics part and, and really kind of diving into the ATF did a great study on one of the line of duty desks we're going to talk about. Um, we, we preach vent limited fires and being able to control doors. And when we do the flashover simulators, we're not using any water. We're controlling everything very easily with doors. Um, with these homes, you lack that compartmentalization. Um, the, the fatal fire here that they were talking about was a, a three-story, 8,400 square foot home that was uncompartmentalized. And that is a lot of these homes. They have these grand staircases. Um, they want it to look nice, look pretty, but that allows that air travel to feed that fire for substantially longer. With that ability for that fire to continue to grow, especially if it's on the basement level, like Don already mentioned, like those are, it's just the hair stands up on the back of your neck. Cause not only now is it more than likely going to be having fire travel in an unprotected um, floor system, but it also now has two floors worth of probably a couple thousand square feet each floor of oxygen. So the amount of time that it allows to burn increases, then the heat release rate will increase, and then the amount of structural members that are potentially being um, dissolved or just burned away are going to allow for that structural collapse. So these homes well, we're used to arriving to more of that vent limited fire where then we become that ventilation point forcing that front door and then it just takes off from there. It's already gonna have that substantial oxygen to it. We just have to be able to then find where it is. And a lot of the times what's happening is it's in the basement, it's not being identified. And when those crews go on the first floor, then there's that catastrophic structural collapse or collapse. And then obviously things lead from there. So the homes with that, and it's just the, the size of them add to the ability for those fire dynamics to be different than what we're used to experiencing on a normal um, 2,000 square foot colonial house. I think we're definitely gonna get into that a little bit more when we talk about the case studies as well. Um, Jeff, what are your thoughts when we talk about when, when you, I, obviously you you passed a couple tests, so coal was wealth probably came up. So area, what does that mean to you when we talk about this? Uh, again, and I think, Listen, aggressive should always be our default, right? And, and it's a little bit different from the first in officer on the rig versus IC coming in. You know, like Jay was saying, you, you got to really understand what that structure is and you're working in. Is it a three and two, uh, a four and three walkout? You know, and understand where you're working and what you're trying to accomplish, right? Um, it, like I said, the area, every, you know, the typical fire ground, there, there sh isn't a crazy amount of radio communication. You know, you're out in the front front porch and you're looking and you can do a lot of verbal stuff you can stick your head in you good or you can see how things are transitioning you're making it's getting better or worse with these big fire grounds one you really can't see what's going on you're relying on radio communications yeah hopefully you're getting a visual cue but things you don't have all your senses that you normally would on a smaller fire ground um and then like i said it just takes longer for everything to get in play but you have guys going in to help out stretching a line or going in to, to get a search done. When you say 
hey, let's get this done, your your lag time is going to be a lot longer. You know, it could just be, you know, divi putting making divisions and getting somebody on that Charlie side and, and kind of delegating that to them. And you really kind of have to piecemeal this fire ground because you can't handle that size or as effectively as you could a smaller fire. If you don't realize that, like I said, you can kind of get behind the curve before you know it. And then that, that's not a good place to be, you know? So. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, uh, that's. But, uh, that. uh, Jason, you mentioned, I'm just going to, uh, and again, for a lot of construction inter integrating into here, but uh, you mentioned basements and, and that's been a common theme a couple of times tonight. It, it kind of to all three of you, but. Are most and this was something when we talked about the other day. Uh, I was surprised about. Are most of these basements finished or no? So, it, from it, my experience, is is it, it's kind of a mixed bag. Obviously, they have enough square footage on floor one and two where they're not really hurting for for area. But also, like Jeff said, that's a perfect spot for somebody's man cave. They might finish a lot of it. You see almost half where these aren't your normal boilers and furnaces. They're essentially having a commercial style. Uh, HVAC setup. Those areas are usually going to be unfinished in a separate area of the basement, and then they might have a finished section as well. It's going to be kind of a split, um, but again, it's always it could be a crapshoot. You could have a full size gym down in the basement, and then that area. So a lot of the times when we go to alarms, we try to just poke down there, obviously just to get to help reset the alarm and just to check it. But it, it's there's not a dead set reason or, or, or rationale behind what they do and how they build them. Um, so it's kind of you just got to get down there and check. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think don't be lulled into it <clears throat> thinking, oh, uh, it's okay. It's nothing's going to happen because that's where I say maybe just a tagline. We never think of it, but you're going into a space that really is the size of some small commercial occupancy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it could be fine when you get down and you take a couple of turns and things start getting, you know, sour on you. And now how do you find your, your way out? But yeah, like, like Jay was saying, I mean, you can go down some of these houses and you'll see, you know, steel I beams. Lolly columns, unfinished versus finished, weight rooms, wine rooms, saunas, you know, it's just, they're really, that's, that's the kind of unnerving thing. You, you can't really take things for granted with a hundred percent confidence. Like you can with some of the more traditional, like I said, Cape colonial split levels, you know, 50, 60 style houses. There's just, yeah. they're big. And just because it's a, a McMansion, like I said, there's, there can be two room, two floors of finished stuff and down in the basement. There's just stuff everywhere. You know, that's not where people are going to be. So they don't finish it off. Things get tight. And and another thing is the utilities. You'll, you'll have utilities in the attic, down in the basement, two, three sets of, of boilers, air handlers. They're just sub panels. You think you're shutting something down and there's two or three sub panels in the house. You know, 200 amp service is the minimum. Right, so, they'll, so they'll actually, if it's a two-story house, they'll have a panel in the basement, but then also maybe a panel in the attic. So you have to, or, or yeah. two HVAC subs, one for the first floor and basement, one for the second floor. Yeah. So, you know, you could have, you know, again, heavier loads than normal up in that yeah. attic or third floor conversion to a playroom that you're not thinking of, or you're thinking, okay, I'm going down to find the utilities. Well, it's not as simple as finding the weather head and chasing it down, you you know, sure. or finding the outside of the house and killing it. All these things kind of spiral into to eating up man, man hours and, you know, that not, that's not getting done as, as quick and flowing as smoothly as it should be on a smaller fire ground. Yeah. And the same thing too, you might be securing that main breaker and then two seconds later, a transfer, transfer switch throws and the generator's kicking on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's another aspect that a normal home you're not having to think of. So understanding, oh, I killed the main breaker. Well, you're probably going to have to go figure out how you can kill the generator or kill a sub panel because it's just so much more in depth than what a normal, normal home is for that's having a, a single. That's home. a really good point. And actually that point, I think uh, in this day and age can transcend to regular houses too. I know a lot of people putting uh, backup generators in, but I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, especially for McMansions um, that, you and know, I, think, yeah. I think it kind of translates into, listen, I, I'm not telling anybody how to conduct their business, but I think you really have to have an assessment of, what you can do as a department, your, your first, whatever your first alarm is, what you got from mutual aid, because it's really just a pecking order. You know, I'm probably going to get two or three of these things that I'm going to concentrate on. I'm not throwing a lot right. of manpower on. And then as mutual aid staggers well, in or rigs 
Great. Yeah, I'll know. I'll stop you there. When we get to apparatus and personnel, we'll hit on that hard. So just um, just to piggyback yeah. it though, uh, real quick about panels. Like these places have you know server rooms that'll challenge you know some of our commercial occupancies, and then and some of the other things are uh, you know we we're talking about two hundred amp services. You know, that's kind of like in a standard colonial now, like my house, I'm going to raise ranch is 200. These places, it's it's 400 amps. And with all the panels, the worst part is most of these people who own these houses, they're not in trades. Yeah, uh, no. you, you, you ask them, OK, hey, you know, where's your panel? And they say, oh, it's right here in the closet. And it's this little, you know, panel. It just says, you know, AC or whatever. Like, no, no, no there's a bigger one somewhere. That That's one of the hardest things is. You know, you're you're trying to go to the subject matter expert, which would be the owner of the house, but sometimes there it's not as helpful as you think. Yeah. So again, more time. Well, I mean, Don, you need a 200 amp panel to power your power tools to build all my props, so that makes yeah. sense. Cordless, lithium ions. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um. So life hazard. I think we touched on most of that with the occupancy, but um. Is there anything we we missed that maybe you thought of since we since we uh, talked about the occupancy side of things? Any of you guys? No. Yeah, I think I think we hit it pretty no. well. Other than you know, it could be the family, it could be the au pair, it could be you know in laws, things like that. So you just don't don't really know. Water, um, Jeff. I'll turn this to you because you mentioned it in the original uh, kind of, you know, what you, one of the Hazard McMansions or what you think of. So. Talk. Yeah, I think it's kind of knowing your district, right. And you say pre-plan, well, you can't necessarily pre-plan these houses. You can to a degree, but it's a different animal. You know, if you're going to a hydrant and mansion area or a neighborhood, okay, you check that off. But like, if you're going a lot of, a lot of these places, you're it's rural water supply. And then that's kind of setting up beforehand. Well, okay, yeah, we're going to rely on tankers. Well, are you nurse tankering it? Are you putting a tanker at the end of the driveway and are you chewing that up from your tanker shuttle? You're going to pump through that. Are you using a pond? Um, I, I think the big thing is being able to delegate that to a water supply officer and just put that off and, hey, give me a heads up when you're good. You got positive water supply. It's, like I said, if if you're in a hydrogen area, man, that's a huge relief. Um, if you're not, you better pay attention and tend to that quick and get that ball rolling. Even if you're designating whatever third do or whoever's coming in, you're my water supply officer, dish them off to a channel and tell them to figure it out. But again, you know, do you drop a LDH manifold and hook in at the, the bottom of the driveway? What's your access like, you know, I mean, the first company lay in, that's all going to take time. If it, is it a 400 foot run or a thousand foot run to the end of the driveway, you know, I think water, it, it it's one or the other. If you can take a little bit of a breath, if it's a hydrogen area, if it's not, your your problem's pretty much just compounded because it takes, even when guys are on point, it takes a while to get that set up and have a positive water supply. So that better change your tactics and think about what you're doing. And yeah, you may not have the exterior exposures, not like a tight neighborhood, but maybe interior. Okay, we're this is where we're stopping it from this part of the house and, you know, cutting it off there. <clears throat> Don? Same thing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to do a tanker shuttle class. And what I could just tell you out of that is, especially for McMansion Mansion, fall for more tankers than you think you need. Because uh, that turnaround time, especially where your fill site is, because we've got, you know, what 75% of Wilton's, you know, non-hydrogen. And it's, it's, it's going to take time and a lot of uh, figuring in that first, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of, you know, fill site and all that good stuff. Um, and you, you, that's waters probably would be my, you know, one thing you don't want to get behind, you know, trying to jump out in front of it. And listen, I know it's it, right. You're aggressive. You're like, we got seven fifty in the tank as a person officer. Let's go whack this, kick the snot out of everyone. Good. And that's I'm not saying don't do that, but if, if you're going to step back and be the IC, you really should kind of give that high priority because that's going to make or break you. You know, and like I said, West and New Canaan and Wilton, those guys are rock stars. They're all water supply and Greenwich, Banksville, Round Hill. They do that. You know, it's kind of like the unsung hero. But if you, I think if you don't pay attention to that, you're, you're setting yourself up for issues, you know. Jay, what do you got? 
I, I would just say a couple of things. Um, one thing that's different with these two is when I first started my career um, in West Haven in the shore there, we never took a driveway. For all these homes, you're you're going down a driveway. And some of these driveways could be your entire bed lay that you have to do. So making that decision of whether you wrap a mailbox and lay in might save you some of that time stepping down as the as the tankers roll up and everything else. And also you will run out of hose depending on how many people you're sending to this, depending on if you're trying to do a relay pump or where you can get to a good tanker shuttle. Um, so you just need to factor in either split lays, train on split lays, what they are, how they work. Um, we have large Ys that we can hook into our five inch. If I do a split lay, that would allow two tankers to pump me um, as a source engine. Um, so kind of have a plan as a department over what might work and then how you can go about just almost like a football team, just kind of calling a play, whether we're doing a tanker shuttle or, hey, next engine, I'm, I'm dropping the Y and we're going to lay in just so you have some idea. And then at the same time, kind of like Jeff said, sometimes you have to play that role. If you think you can get up there with 750 and maybe I can get a knock on it, my play might be to have my second two engine come directly up to the scene. I double my manpower and then now I have 1500 gallons per minute, but it's going to be more of that aggressive. You're going to have to make that call as that first an officer to push the envelope. But if you think you can get in, if it's one room off and you can make, make a stop on it, then maybe that might be your move to do. And, and so sometimes it's not an easy steadfast rule, but those are some of the challenges you have to kind of make for a decision. And then with that and with these homes, um, your, required water that you're going to need to put out the uh, energy that these fires are producing is going to be more than a normal traditional house um, because it has more oxygen because it has more stuff it's going to have a higher heat release rate so we're going to have to be using more water to put it out so it's almost like you're screwed because you're very rarely finding these homes in hydrogen areas um, they're more of the rural areas of towns so you're already kind of be behind the eight ball once it starts getting away um, there's all the formulas you can use length times width divided by three in percentage, but th there's just so much that you need um, to, to factor in when you're making that decision of, of what, what play you're going to do when it comes to water supply. So I want to expand on both of this uh, on both on two points a little bit. Um, alternate water supplies. Obviously you guys talked about hydrants and um, tankers. Have you ever, I've seen, you know, the Facebook videos, but is it realistic to draft out of people's pools? Have you done that? Um, dry hydrants on people's properties. And then even if it is hydranted, are you guys generally laying in from the hydrant or are you, I'll call it laying in from the hydrant, but putting a, uh, an engine on the hydrant to pump it if it's a, especially a long lay as well? So I, I would say I've seen uh, an engine pump out of a large puddle in somebody's uh, driveway um, that was just basically flooded over and they tried it as an alternate water source and they were able to get a draft out of it with a low flow strainer. Um, pools are there, but for us, it's going to be the reach to get to the pool. We only have two lengths of hard suction on our engines, so it's going to be a little more challenging. We luck out. We have dry hydrants and a couple cisterns throughout the town, so you can use those um, those as well to kind of help out establish another water source. And then if it is a long lay, um, kind of the rule of thumb I've always been taught is if you drop your bed, you drop an engine. So if you lay your whole bed a hose and you got to pump that dry hydrant or pump that um, in the, set, the center of that relay, that would kind of be the move to do just to get yourself enough uh, pressure and flow to get up to the scene. Cool. Jeff, uh, Don, anything on that? Yeah, I think uh, pools, that's usually no bueno. I mean, oh. and that's where you run into. We run into a lot of things now where things are listed on the uh, tablet or the iPad as water sources, but it's really not a legit water source. And that's kind of where the pre-planning comes in, getting out. Are you are you drafting your dry hydrants or your cisterns once a year to make sure you can get that that positive water supply? Um, it, like I said, it's a, uh, it's a lot to accomplish. And unless you're good at it and, and proactive and staying on point, come crunch time it, it can leave you in the lurch you know okay uh don good or anything yeah it's the same thing it's you All know right. you got two on a piece so it's impossible yeah. right so those things look good on social media but may not be as uh valuable for the actual fire ground as 
Yeah. I think and another thing too that that we run into all the time is you need people for everything. Right. Like I still need people at the house to help me either search or put this fire out. And water supply sometimes, obviously, like like Jeff said, it's it, it takes a lot of people to do. And sometimes when you look around, you just you're running out of people for all of these tasks. You'll de- to try to make one person set up a draft. It, it, you can't you can't yeah. ask somebody to do that. It's impossible. So now you have an engine company detailed just to set up a, a draft site. So as like you said, it, we were getting better with identifying a water supply officer, and then that officer changes channels and just manages that whole operation, um, which frees up radio communications for those on the scene. But you kind of look around and you start listening to these fires and you, you question like, well, who, who the hell's at the scene? Like who's even up there with those guys helping right. them? Right. Cause you just, you run out of people so quickly. So it's kind of like trying to, and as, as Jeff or as like a shift commander can probably speak more of it. I can only imagine trying to figure out where I can get people from, without putting anybody in a precarious situation where they were either working by themselves or just two people trying to do something. That's a great point. I, I'm going to go off because it's water. I'm going to go off on a little bit. And and you guys, this is, this could be a two hour discussion. We're going to keep it quick, but um, inch and three quarter or two and a half. And is it always two and a half? Is it always inch and three quarter? Um, and, maybe even get a little bit, where are you charging the line? Is there a case where you would, you know, I was always taught private dwellings, you're charging it on the outside, but I realized that that's probably not the case when it's a 4,000 square foot house. And I got to advance to the second floor with three guys on the rig. So line, line uh, choice and where I'm charging it. Uh, we'll talk about placement a little bit later, but line choice and where I'm, char- where I'm charging it. So Jay. Um. I'm, I'm pulling an inch and three quarter unless I'm going defensive because I just don't have the people. So I, we run with a three person crew, um, a nozzle man, myself, and then our chauffeur is going to be helping. Um, we could flow about 185 gallons per minute out of it. And I, I need the ability to have the speed and mobility of that inch and three quarter line. Um, and then at the same time, I think, yes, like, where are we putting it? The standard of, oh, you're always going to go through the A side is, is not the case. And we're, I mean, you're going to stretch dry if you've done it charged and you've probably been gassed and, and want to kill yourself afterwards, you'll next time you do it, you're going to stretch dry and you're going to push the envelope a little bit, but that's where training with your pump operator to make sure they're good. That when I call for water, I'm not going to hear the primer going and, and keep having a call for a, a few times, having that confidence in them will allow you to maybe push the envelope a little bit further to stretch drive because you're just not going to be able to accomplish all the tasks you need to do once you knock down that, that wall, that, uh, that fire, because you're already going to have to transition into searching, searching off the line, working together. And we just don't have the manpower. Listen, if, if we were like you in the city and I could have two engine companies dedicated, maybe I would pull a two and a half for, for a more advanced fire. I just can't with the, with the three person. I mean, I think this is such a good discussion because, you know, and you brought it up before the uh, width times depth times height, whatever. Oh, I need a two and a half. Well, that's great. But if you got two guys, how are you going to do a two and a half for that? And certainly, again, unlimited manpower. Yeah. If you told me I had two rooms off at a 5,000 square foot house, I'm probably thinking about, do I need a two and a half now? But if I can't advance the two and a half, how does that help me? You know, and and also too, I would say you have to factor in water management. Um, okay. I can, if I have to flow that two and a half from down a hallway, I'm dumping water and I don't have the ability to make that corner to, to hit the seat of the fire. If I have that inch and three quarter, I can maybe cool that environment as I'm moving, I'm flowing less water. Therefore I have more for once I make that push into the room to get the water where it needs to go. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, and I know the, the, like you said, once you see the volume of fire, but it's impressive what an inch and three quarter can do and put out, especially we run smooth war, 15, 16 tips. We're flowing 185 gallons per minute. We're putting a good amount of water out there. Um, so that is, uh, if I'm pulling a two and a half, we're, we're going to use it outside, shut it down and then pull an inch and three quarter in the, into the inside. Okay. Jeff, what do you think? A hundred percent. I mean, it's so easy to say two and a half inside when you're standing out front, but like I said, the time, the effort it takes to get that where it needs to be and allow guys to 
get water on the seat of the fire and, and start making progress. I just think the inch and three quarter is the realistic play, you know, especially with everybody's that, that's manpower limited, you know, um, the two and a half to be able to hit, move and push with two or three guys. You're asking a lot, I think, you know, and Jay said, you can blow 180, 200 gallons a minute. You put out some good fire with that. And I think that's the reality. Yeah. Stretch dry. If you can get to a, a good place where you can, you know, if you have a couple, three or four bends, a couple flights of stairs and you got to stretch dry to that, that safe area and then charge it. Yeah. By all means. What do you consider a safe area? So if someone's saying, Hey, I'm, I'm newer in the fire, like what is for, I have my barometer, but what do you consider where you'll say, all right, now it's time to charge the line. Well, hopefully if that officer's going in and kind of ferreting out where it is. If, if you open that door and it's banked down, well, you know, it's probably under you or something's nasty, but if you got good visibility, you you know, your thermal layer is up high. You can make it up to that second floor. You kind of see, maybe you're standing up. You're not getting driven down by heat. That's a good area to kind of stage. Okay. We're going to mount up here and then go, you know, and it's kind of a judgment call. And that's where, you know, a good officer or senior guy, whoever's in first will be able to, to get that feedback and say, okay, we can make it to this point and, and, this is where we're going from, you know, it's not stretching in blind, believe me, but that's, again, I think comes back to where, what Jay was talking about. If, if you get that eyes on all sets of areas of the building, all sides, you kind of have an idea of what it's, where it is. Use your tick, whatever, just make sure you're not stretching over it. You have to kind of, with these sets of building, you, you have to work smart as well, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, for me in general, uh, if I'm on air, I should probably have a charge hose line. So to your point, yeah. and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I open the front door and it's clear. It's a 5,000 square foot house. Yeah. Let's go dry, you know, but now yeah. I get to the second floor and I need to put my mask on. All right. I should probably have a charged hose line now. Yeah. So. And again, that's what your conditions are going to dictate, right? You open the door and you see, okay, this is, this is good. This is, I got some room here. We got some wiggle room. You're okay. Yep. Don, what do you I got? agree. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, let me see if no. Don's got anything and then I'll come back to you, Jack. Yeah. The situation. Our big thing is the situation is going to dictate what you do. Um, so it is not uncommon for us to, yep. Grab a two and a half, whack the snot out of it, drop it where it lays and then go mop up with an inch and three quarter. Uh, and what I will say, we had a fire a couple of years ago. It was, you know, in the attic, which was again, didn't know where the access was. It burned through the roof and it's, drop it in three rooms and it's you know you're kind of by yourself and you have an inch three quarter it's easy to go from room to room to room and maneuver that two and a half that is never happening so it's just it's it's hard in this you know time in the fire service to get all that experience but just you know taking tidbits from classes you know like flash fire classes you know uh just reading smoke and all that good stuff is just you know putting all those um you know, slides in your head together and say, okay, I can do this. This is safe. This is still good. And, and, you know, make it a good judgment on that. So. And I yeah. think, and Jay, I'll turn over to you in a minute. I think everything you guys said, like, cause I'll get into uh, discussions and like, oh, we could stretch a two and a half. And it's like, all right, we'll go do it. And one of the things is, that, you know, like the seminars I've done where we've done um, simulations or whatnot, you know, I'll put up the exact fires we're talking about and someone will say we need a two and a half for that and i'm and i look back to what we said your response was and it's you know three people a rig and you know not enough manpower to do that and i say okay well then go do that at your next drill try to stretch that two and a half and maneuver it and see how that works and if it works then yeah put that in your arsenal but most likely you're going to realize that hey three guys on a rig is not going to um, be able to maneuver it where we need to go or do what we need to do. And so at any tactic you guys want to do, and I'm not talking to you three, but in general, any tactic you guys want to do that you see, like make sure you can actually do it. And it's not just, oh, well, you know, this department does it. So it, and it works for them. So it will work for us. It needs to, I mean, even Jeff could probably talk better than any of you guys. He, he works in one department that has three to any, anyone have four rig in Greenwich or no. So three yeah. rig to yeah. six is shipped. So he, he sees really both sides of it where, you know, even maybe for him, he'll show up to the same fire. If he's the captain yes. in Wilton, it's one thing. If he's the chief in Greenwich, it's a different tactic. 
So yeah, I, I think it really comes down to this. It's as whoever you're riding with, you know what their capability. If they're a fish, it's going to dictate what you're doing, right? And and so just because you could do something doesn't mean you should. So like you're saying, Dan, and I really think you have to have an honest talk and, or understanding of who am I working with today and what's my best play. And, you know, my job, I think, or all of our jobs are, you get in the whole debate, oh, transitional, hit it from the outside, oh, you're, you're soft, you're not going in. My job is to give whoever's in there the best chance to survive. And if that's knocking it down, sweeping the eaves, pushing it in through the window for 20, 30 seconds, it's darkening it down, and then get inside, okay, maybe that's your play. If it's to stretch in dry to get in and push from the inside out, that's your play. And I think you just, you know, you really got to kind of digest and what's the best play to give whoever's inside the best chance to get out and egos aside and everything else aside. And it's kind of on the fly and your, your circumstances are going to dictate like they say, and you know, just make an informed decision. Jay, uh, I've skipped you a couple of times. Do you, do you no, you're fine. Something? No, go, no. Do you something on, on that before we move on. Yeah, just a quick, the only caveat I would say to stretching dry is if I think it's in the basement, even if I can see on that first floor, I'm stretching, I'm going to stretch charged. I'm going to charge at the front door and still go in just with the, I don't know with how large these basements are, how well off it is, it might be hidden. Um, I'm just going to yeah. feel more comfortable in that sense, advancing to those stairs with the charge line. It's going to suck, but if I, I would rather find an at grade level if I could, but if not, I'm, I'm going to go in. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. No, and then the I, other think, thing, I think that's a good point. I think we're going to get into it guys. I, I think we're going to talk about basement fires a lot more uh, towards the end of this, um, because you brought up a couple of good points. And I know that in the um, uh, case studies, I think both of them were basement fires. So yeah. um, I, I want to talk more about basement fires, particularly what you're talking about. Um, so for now, let's go to, uh, let's go on to the next coal as well. Auxiliary systems. So obviously we probably don't have standpipes. Are you seeing sprinklers, um, fire alarms, or is there nothing? Does that affect anything? What are you guys seeing? And how often are fire alarms being from, you know, a legit, it ends up being a legit fire? We've had a few that, that, yeah, it came in as a uh, an automatic alarm, and then you'll get the heads up, okay, the, the occupant says their, their house is on fire. There's smoke in the room, okay. building. Um, stand or, uh, sprinklers, yeah, some of the bigger mansions will. Um, not a lot of the McMansions that I've seen, you know, four, five, six, seven thousand square feet. Um, but, uh, you know, then it's either, or, well, you're flying the wire, you're taking a long line in, you know, what's your play there from auxiliary appliance kind of? I think uh, I think for this auxiliary appliance is more on the um, outside of our stuff. Like, yeah, is it sprinkler standpipe? Not what you're talking about, which is like, are we taking? I, I haven't seen a lot of sprinklers in these these smaller no, yeah. smaller mansions or big mansions now. Which I think is interesting because it's being pushed. You know, it, it's being pushed as you should sprinkler your home. But I agree, I'm not yeah. seeing them much at all. Um, so what I will say is, I think. It's, I'm sure it's mentioned because uh, even you go further, some of those uh, LVLs and things, there actually there is a fire rated coating on them, but it's more money. So if I can, you know, if I'm going to put in, you know, fire rated, you know, uh, LVLs or whatever beams and whatnot uh, and a sprinkler, but I can't have my two wine rooms, you know, where that's headed. So, and I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you guys do. If you have a well, can you put, still put a sprinkler system in? Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. One of our guys at work has a uh, a sprinkler system off of a well. And how does that, so theoretically, if you have a fire in your house, you lose power. What's powering the water to the sprinkler system? Do you know? I, I believe, I think he has a backup generator. Okay. I believe for it. All right. But yeah, like, like Don and Jeff said, I've, I've very rarely seen a sprinkler. It's never actually gone to a fire where it's worked. And very rarely do we see it because we, we would go there for probably a, a burst pipe or something. And we, we haven't had that. Um, one thing what you, cause you brought up fire alarm systems. I think something that's get taken for granted is we'll be going to a call for reported smoke. And then in the cab, you'll see an update. It'll be like, okay, they just got a call from ADT for basement heat. Don't, I think a lot of times that information goes to the wayside and that might be a great indicator for us for fire location or fire spread. And sometimes obviously when it's a reported structure fire and, and those little 
minute details might be giving us enough information where it says second floor family room smoke or something like that, that might key us more into location for fire or and different things like that. Because all of these places not only have fire alarms, carbon monoxide, gas detectors, heat detectors, they have the whole plethora of it usually. So do, when you you said updates, you get that to your tablet. Um, does dispatch say it or you it, it it's on you to see it on the tablet? So for, for us, for a lot of the times, a lot of the vital information, um, the dispatcher will not. And also because everybody's signing on, everybody's talking on the radio, that might just be on the, we get it as an updated cat alert. So it's just like a little blur spelled out. Um, and if you're looking at the map or not jocking me back to look back at those notes, you're going to miss on those things. So if you're just going to a neighbor called in a reported fire and you show up with just smoke everywhere. And then you look afterwards and you say, Oh yeah, it showed a basement heat detector was the first activation. That's going to be good information that you should be looking into and say, Oh crap, maybe it's in the basement. Cause that's the first detector that went off. Okay. It, it, it might cue you in a little bit more. And a lot of times that information if you're already going there for a fire, people, well, why do I need to know where the activated head is? Well, because it's going to hmm. give you an idea where to go. So little information like that, if you could take that extra second to read those updates and read those notes. Um, I think kind of parlaying off that and just kind of, let's make it into like street conditions or whatever. But I, I think, listen, you're on a two-man rig. It, it doesn't apply. But I think in Greenwich, being in that right front seat, it, if you get a crew that's tight, guy in the back seat is pulling up Trulia, Zillow, whatever. He's looking up that residence and he's getting a flop the floor plan or, or square footage or he's seeing the driveway and what the access looks like. I mean, the, those are things that, you know, if you're a tight engine company or truck company, you can you can go a long way towards improving and decreasing your operational time to get into play. You know, and I think that's something that's over uh, overlooked a lot of times. You know, uh, the guy in the back seat, don't overlook him. He, he can be flipping through or she can be flipping through and seeing, hey. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, whatever wires on the opposite side of the streets. Now you know the truck can take the inside. Or hey, this is a long dog leg left driveway. I don't think we'll be able to get in. We've got a back in. You know, I think it's a, if everybody's kind of dialed in and, and spitballing back, it, it can help improve things. Yeah, the IC may get credit for saving the house, but all those little things kind of made everything happen. I you think know. that's a great point, Zillow, all that. Jeff, you told me you can do that while you're driving, right? <laughs> yeah, I am probably one of the most computer illiterate dudes <laughs> on this job. First, I can't see it, so I got to put cheaters on. But I think it, it's stressful, right? That guy in the right seat has a lot going on. You're trying to make sure you get there safely. And if a guy or a girl isn't familiar with the roads, you're trying to guide them there. So that, that person in the back seat, if you're lucky to have it, I don't care, career volunteer, pull that. If, if they can kind of add in and say, hey, Lou, we got a 300 foot straight shot driveway, or this is a, a 600 foot driveway. I don't think we're going to make it, you know, all those well, things help. So when you uh, look at, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, when you look at how most fire departments are, everybody's on their phone all day mm -hmm. long. And for that five or six minute drive, when you could be getting the most vital information that can help you, everyone has their phone now just listening to the siren and just kind of like right. just jacked up, ready to go. Filming out so, the window as you're going, go get them. Exactly. exactly. So Put TikTok guys, down and just yeah. search. I'm going to let you continue, but you basically went to the next one, which is street conditions. And so continue. I, street conditions. Yeah, I think, again, from a, from a quote unquote operational standpoint, you know, first in, you're like, let's get in there, stuff it in. We got to get that line in first do. I, I, like Jay was saying, I mean, access a lot of these times you know we're not doing coordinated vertical vent we don't have the manpower a lot of times coming into these driveways the soft skate i mean can the truck get in there is it a midship is it a rear stick are you backing in can you get to where you need to be it's not like you know a straight block where you can pull up and, and you know two trucks can shoot both corners and it's a 30 foot setback so maybe your aerial is out of play or maybe it's getting up but it's not in the ideal situation maybe you've only got room for that first in engine and the aerial, or do you piecemeal the aerial off and get a tanker in there? I don't know. I think I, but access for a lot of these places, as far as street conditions, that can be an issue. You know, you have elevation, you have kind of switchbacks, everything's Belgian blocks. There's a lot of columns at the end, gates. So where well, can you get in? Yeah. So, uh, and I'll let everyone chime in, but gates, um, talk about those, uh, you know, your regular fire, fire alarm. Do they there. open for you? I, I literally no. They, you know what? You have we have tricks. They're supposed to, yeah. Yeah, they're supposed to, or they'll shoot you a code. But nine times out of ten, or eight times out of ten, it's it delays the whole process. 
you know, and it's. So when you, when I just took the time one day, I called FAC was a, a gate company that we see a lot of. And after I kind of convinced the guy that I wasn't a robber and, and we kind of were able to talk a little bit about uh, some of it. So a lot of the tricks that we use, people have probably seen the YouTube videos of sliding a ladder underneath to, to hit two sides of that induction loop to, to get it to trigger, to get open. Um, that works sometimes, but uh, there's a lot of other easy things that you can do to try to get in. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there, there's a specific siren, the Yelp feature is sometimes programmed for these gates to open. So if you hold that Yelp feature down for three to five seconds, it might actually actuate the gate all on its own with that. Um, and then if you could find the box that's usually on the opposite side, if you just hop a small wall or just crawl around, open that box up nine times out of 10 in the bottom left-hand corner, it looks like a doorbell. And you just hit that doorbell switch and the gate's just going to open. And that's a testing feature for those guys who install those gates. So it's a quick and easy override um, just to get the gates open for us during the day without having to do any damage. Um, and then the only a aspect to that afterwards is for your follow on companies. If you could find where they have photo eyes, we could take a safety vest, put it over that photo eye. So it's going to keep that gate remained open, or there's always a bystander. You could just show them right where that little push button is. Say, hey, when the next truck comes in, hits, hits this button, open it for them. So that they, they cause a lot of headaches for us. Um, in the last fire they had last week, they were about ready to ram it open. And we've done that in the past if you have to. And the homeowner came screaming over and was able to open it. Um, so definitely a challenge from the street side trying to get into some of these homes. I don't know where he is, but I'll, uh, Dan's dead. Dan's dead. I'll chime in there. Yeah, I'm right here, but. I figured, right. um, I figured you two would chime in. So go ahead. Yeah, see? Uh, so in, in going back to Jeff's point about the aerial, it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's obviously knowing your, your, your reach and everything, but you might be better off going to a neighbor's house, you know, especially common driveway if you can and shooting across the yard that's been done before. Um, it's, we've been lucky. We've, we've got a couple of guys who are heads up and, on our job and, and we can add stuff to our cat and, and our uh, next gen and whatever. Um, so we, sometimes we'll actually go out with uh, the owner's permission. And we'll actually uh, measure out the driveway. So we know, okay, this is longer than 1200 feet. You know, we need a relay pumper in there. Um, other things, access switchbacks, because, you know, they put houses wherever they can afford to, you know, build them. Um, so we kind of keep eyes on that stuff and we try to add it to the CAD. So if, you know, that address pops up, bing, all right, here's some stuff on the outside that's going to jack you up um, just to try to get ahead of that. Jeff, you got anything? No, like I said, it's, it's not always as straightforward as rolling up and having a, you know, 30-foot setback in a, in a traditional neighborhood. Um, the driveways are usually longer and setback. And again, maybe like in uh, Atlanta or D.C. where they have the McMansion clusters, that's a little different. You know, Wilton, it's two acre zoning. Uh, when it's the back country, you have bigger lots, but you have more opulent driveways to try and get in. And those, you know, those turning radiuses, can you get in? And then can you get your outriggers down or your short jacket? So an astute aerial guy well, can really make or break that operation, you know. And like I said, we don't do a lot of coordinated vertical vent because it's just a timing thing. We'll, we'll get the stick up and try and get to the roof if we have to. But um, it, it can be, you know, and that's... You dropped your hose in the driveway. Now, what does that do for second and third coming units? You know. Yeah. Uh, anything else on treat before we move on, guys? No. Sounds good. Weather. Uh, I think weather is more of a specific, uh, you know, day of. So I don't think there's too much to touch on there. But um, I what will, I will say, yeah, no, I, I said I'll leave it to you if you have anything to touch on. One thing, because we take the driveways, uh, you know, make sure you know your driver's comfortable. Like we've had issues in the snow, you know, getting those on spots down before you hit the driveway, because um, it's that's your one and only shot if that place is rank, uh, ripping. Um, so just you know, it's always in the back of your mind, access, and even you know, sometimes these places they're not you know plowed out or whatever it's just another headache uh to add to the mix that thing too with with if you're putting that aerial in that driveway 
more than likely you're pushing the envelope and you're not having a stable platform or, or place to set that up. So I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable if the ground's been frozen and if, if those ground pads are going off onto a driveway, I'm not going to have the aerial go long and low, kind of keep it more elevated so it's more stable. But if, like Don said, if it's been raining a bunch, I'm not going to feel as comfortable if we put an 80,000 pound tower ladder with the, the outriggers onto the front lawn. Um, and please use your ground pads. Or if you forget <laughs> ground pads. Please use your ground pads. <laughs> and we, not I mean, saying it's happened. Like, but we yeah. laugh. I mean, these are our own personal experiences where we just had a fire not too long ago and it, it just, you're moving quick. Lock. The ground pads weren't, weren't used. And it, I mean, I don't know if you were there, Jeff, but the pictures, it, it caved in the driveway significantly. Well, the guys in the aerial say they can feel it bouncing. You know, it's not a good day. Plus, yeah. I mean, you know, you don't know where the leaching generalization yeah. Yeah. you know these have wells leaching fields you don't know where those are sometimes they're in the front sometimes they're in the back so everything like that kind of but then again you go to a chimney fire here you need an aerial in there to get to this ornate yeah. chimney that's up 12 feet in the air because you're not getting there with ground ladders so sometimes you have to kind of push the envelope with getting that aerial in there and that comes to how you spec your trucks out how you can get it and then also kind of like like Don said, evaluating that weather and, and where where you think you can either do it or you can't. And, and ultimately, like I said, knowing who is wheeling that piece. You know, there are guys where I'm like, if, if, if can you get it in there? Yep. And it's rock solid. There are no worries. You're like, this dude, he's on point. I'm not worrying about it. There are other people like, oh, okay, you know, and it just comes, it, it's obvious stuff, right? Match to the obvious. Know who you're working with, what their capabilities are. So uh, Greenwich is a little bit different than Wilton in that Greenwich has specific uh, staffing for apparatus. Wilton does, but if correct, if I'm wrong, you have, you know, the first two engine at a headquarters and then the next. You're jumping. One, I'm sorry? You're, you're jumping a piece. Tanker right. So when you're talking about aerials, like if you have a fire in a McMansion non hydrated area, the aerial's not going initially, right? No, it's water. Right, so what, and it's mutual aid aerials, New Canaan and North Westport, okay. you know. And so again, by that time, usually that piece is boxed out. Correct. Okay. And so it, you know, it's a toolbox. It's it's writ. It's you know. So and then I mean, it got to the, go and that's the way you like it. So if you're saying if if someone's watching here and saying, hey, I have an engine, a truck, and a tanker. And I have the choice of either bring, and it's a non hydrogen area, and I have the choice of either bringing, you know, my engine and my tanker, or my engine and my ladder. You're going engine well, and tanker, dude. Wa water always wins, man. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, not to be glib, but mm -hmm. it, uh, and again, love truck work, doing the whole truck thing. But if you know you're watching this thing burn from an aerial versus inside flowing water and putting it out, uh, you got to take the, the water. And again, oh, that comes to whatever you're agreements are if you've got guys on point mutual aid that are coming quick okay then you make that call but for for us in that situation it, it's you're taking water because that's your fail safe for your safety your fudge factor you know so let me ask you this and and, and you know you talked about the need of an aerial for like a chimney fire um so how do you uh manage that in wilton if you have something comes cool. in a chimney fire could be a structure fire Right. Yeah. And they just don't know. So how are you managing that? Funny story, right? Stories. Anyway, um, it's kind of goes back to knowing who you're working with. Anyway, we had a call years ago in Greenwich and a couple of overtimes working. It came in smoking a building at three in the morning, whatever. Update. Yeah, the homeowner smells smoke. We get in there. I tell the guy in the back seat, I'm like, get in there and tell me what you got. And by that I meant if you tell if you're smelling class A, right? It, then it's a little more pucker factor. If you go in there and you say, oh, you know what? This is a belt or an air handler. Then it, you kind of take it down. So I sent him in. He's like, okay, yeah, no, I don't really smell anything. Long story longer. Turned it out being an air handler, not a big deal, but he comes out and he's like, you do realize I have no sense of taste or smell, don't you? And I was like, no. I'm like, you could if so knowing that beforehand, you know what I'm saying? But getting back to that, I was like, oh, you're killing me smalls. But again, it's it's little things you kind of take for granted. But okay, if it's chimney fire, yeah, then then when that first in crew and that that officer whoever does recon says, hey, yeah, you know what, I'm up on the second floor, I'm in the attic. I think we got a chimney fire. I, I don't think it's extending. Well, then you kind of make arrangements and you can get that first in truck up there, you know. And uh, okay, I'll 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 beach the the air the tanker out on the street and you know you handjack a couple hundred feet of hose. That's doable, you know. 
But uh, again, it really depends on that first and report and obviously location and extent, you know. I have the same thing. I have the same story doing airbag training up on red, up on yellow, and the kid was messing it up. And I said, yo, what is your problem? He's like, oh, I'm colorblind. I was like, oh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> yeah. Jay, I'm not going to say any names because I don't want to end up in a bag somewhere on the side of the river. But I think Oh, I know who exactly who that yeah. is. <laughs> so listen, I, every, you know, it, that's what kind of, you know, you learn from. I took it for granted. And like I said, that's kind of my rough barometer. I'm not saying it's right. You get in that building, you smell class, say, okay, things tend to pucker up a little. Uh, if it's electrical or belty, okay, well, we kind of step it down a notch. But anyway. Yeah, that's rant. a good point. But, and I'll go back to the beginning. If it comes in as a chimney fire, what are you guys taking? Engine and tanker or engine and ladder? Yeah, tanker. Because you know what? End of story, worst comes to worst, you throw a 28 okay. and a roof ladder, and you can probably get there. But if you don't have water... There, you can't rectify that situation, I think. And I, I'm not saying I'm right, but I would much have 2,500 gallons sitting in the driveway to give me a, a better shot versus a, a good picture aerial spot, you know? Perfect. All right. Uh, exposures. I don't think we're going to hit on this for too long, but please, uh, you know, maybe propane tanks, things like that. Um, are exposures a consideration here? What are you guys thinking? Whoever talks, yeah, like, you, can like go you said, on. doing that, doing that 360. Sometimes you go around the back and you'll see a few large propane cylinders that might be in proximity. So that might be something that you have to deal with. Um, but for for close structures next to it, for as an exposure, maybe you have detached garages or a cottage or something like that. Other than that, most of these homes are on relatively decent amount of acreage. There's really not too much right up on top of them. So uh, from my experiences, the exposure problems is more like internal exposures, rooms and stuff like that. Nothing on, on the external side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. It's the exposure, it's almost, it's itself. It, you know, right. These things are so big. And I think kind of parlaying with that, it's like, listen, you get in there, I need water in that, that space, whatever's burning. So get that drywall down, open up, see what it, all that drywall is coming out anyway. Once it dries out three, 400 degrees, it's coming out anyway, it loses its rating. So get in there, open up and get, get water flowing into where, whatever space is burning, you know? Yeah. Um, apparatus and personnel. So I think this we'll probably spend a couple minutes on. We got three more after that, and then we'll get into case studies. But I mean, I think manpower is the biggest issue with any fire. So how does that, you know, you get dispatched to a two-story private dwelling versus something like this. How does that change your mindset in terms of personnel? So if you, if you just look at how like the NFPA looks at a single family residence, they're based off of a, it's a 2000 square foot home with no basement. So I think they're saying you're supposed to send 17 guys on your, on your first fire. Our, our setup is, is still saying that this is a single family home, but it might be triple or quadruple the size. So probably from Jeff, from a, from a command standpoint, probably would think of getting more people here earlier. Once you identify it is one of these homes, calling mutual aid, calling the additional resources that you're going to need, um, because it isn't a single family residence when you think about all we talked about with construction and stuff like that. So just getting more people there. Um, you could always return them if it ends up being nothing, but if it appears like you have something then it's going to be uh, escalating, getting, getting more resources there sooner than later is going to be helpful. Yeah. And I think it's a realistic assessment of, of where you are as a department. Wilton one, maybe two lines, you know, you it's, that's the reality of it. You know, we'll be augmented by, by mutual aid coming in. Um, but you really have to understand, Hey, and be realistic. This is, what we can handle and you're picking a few of these points and this is what you're focusing on you know uh, i just think you, you have to be honest with what you can realistically get done at those critical moments to give yourself the best shot to, to get ahead of this and stay ahead of it you know yeah yeah we had a uh there's another story but we had an officer saying all right i need this 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 and this done he was you know the captain the shift commander and the lieutenant goes pick one of them and that's that's the mindset. So, I mean, that's what I always say when I do my tactics class is, you know, someone will inherently come up and say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And I said, 
I mean, you just hit the book answer perfectly, but we also just said you only have eight guys here. So pick yeah. one or two of those to do, you right. know? Yeah. Um, and it's not a slight on anyone or anything. It's just oh, reality. It's really you have to understand where you're at in, in the spectrum, you know? No, absolutely. Uh, so mutual aid, uh, let's touch on mutual aid quick. Uh, if you're, you're recommend, and again, uh, I, I would assume most of the time uh, something comes in for a fire, it's probably a fire. It's not like complete BS. Um, when are you calling mutual aid? Is it on the initial dispatch when you get there? What, what What's your opinion on that? Well, I think in Greenwich, we're lucky because we have, you know, you got a robust volunteer section, right? You got Banksville's good water, Roundhill's coming in, a lot of the volunteers. So they don't, we don't really use mutual aid. I know in Wilton, yesterday's fire, it was all relying on mutual aid, you know, because, yeah, they got that, they had two lines stretched by the time I got there, but then there were gas. So we had Westport coming in, which was huge. New Canaan was there, Norfolk was there, Weston was there. And yeah, when, when you get that second call or that, update hey homeowner heard a pop he's got smoke boom kick it up a notch you know then all right send everybody and then we'll kind of decipher figure out what we have and dial it back um yeah so will yeah it's uh, just the lag time is is what kills you i think the lag time is true and one thing you guys haven't mentioned would which i'm sure is like there you just didn't say it is like usually these houses are more in the rural area, right? So even if everyone's in the firehouse, it just takes longer to get there. It's not like, oh, you're two blocks away or something like that, you know? So, and that's, so Wilton, the, the town is for, for our dispatching. So if it's a structured fire, the town is gridded out, you know, kind of geographically, but, but more importantly, whether hydrogen or not. And our dispatch, it's, it's working, I guess, but it's, if it comes in as a structured fire, boom, north end of town, automatically it, you know, sends out Georgetown, uh, Weston, Ridgefield. Um, and I think we're actually, because of that tanker drill, we're adding tankers from, you know, the New York side of things versus if it's in the south end of town, you know, Westport, Norwalk, New Canaan, all those guys. So it, we have, um, things in play to kind of get us rolling so if, if it comes in as a fire and dispatch you know is johnny in the spot uh mutual aid's coming fairly quickly still delay but you know easier than having it all it still on takes time but yeah right right easier than waiting to get there to jeff to say okay now i need this 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 and this well, yeah front load it right Front load is the, I, I mean, it's not like you're getting calls for fires every day in these places. Nah. Right? So if yeah. you get it, start it out. Right? Yeah. Um, location. So I think this is interesting. Uh, we'll spend a, a minute or two. Um, you know, the address is probably the address and we got it. Uh, this says declare an exact A side designation. So I think that's interesting because of, some of the things you guys have mentioned that, hey, you know, the fire could be in one area, but we're going to stretch from another area. It's not always through the front door, like a split level or a cape or something like that. So are you maintaining the A side as the front door? Are you, and certainly there's, with most of these, there's no street side, right? Like we've come up some sort of a driveway. So what is the A side? Do we adjust it for where we stretch the line or is the A side where the front door is i would i would think if it if there's any question of where the a side is it's got to be clarified right. uh, depending on if it's hey wherever the first two engine parked that's going to be our a side um because like you said the street side it could be a winding turning driveway so it ends up where you're at um, and not only the a side but also the floor levels you might have two floors in the front or a single story and you go around the Bravo side and now it's two floors below, it's just how it's been built. Some of these are pretty unique. So depending on where you are as a crew, and I've had it where I entered in on what another crew thought was essentially the second level of a basement, I thought that was floor one and I thought it was a four story. So for me, if I call a mayday or I have a problem, um, it, it should just be command rectifying, hey, wherever engine one went in with their line, that's floor one. And then we have basement one, basement two. 
um, just to, to make sure that there isn't that question or that doubt if something goes wrong, how you can call for help or where your location is. Because you might even have, and we'll show later, um, Charlie's side upper and Charlie's side lower. So the, the way that these houses are, they're not just a, a square or a rectangle. They're, they're very ornate, um, different setups. So clarifying that will definitely help eliminate some of that confusion. So there really sometimes isn't a defined reason of being front door is A or not. And I even yeah. talk about that uh, just real quick. When I talk about raised ranches, every time I do a class, I'll say, what are you calling both levels? And half the class will say basement first floor. The other will say first floor, second floor. And it's like, yeah. So you guys are already on different pages before, and this is a raised ranch that's 1200 square feet. So Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, a good point is wherever that, wherever you're setting up command and you're bringing that command board grant, you need like a, you need a Sherpa to get it there. Right. But I think that command board said it, that it's really an accountability board. So it gives you a hub of, of the operations for that event. So if you set that up and out, like Jay was saying, where that first in peach piece is and you're stretching off, that would be my my alpha side, you know. And again, pet peeve, Jim Guy's props to him. Awesome. I learned so much from that guy. Just simple things like radio transmission, Alpha Bravo, Delta, Charlie Delta, not A, B, C, D. Because you know, things like that, did you say B or D? I didn't hear it, you know. And I, I again the small things trip you up, but I use I, one, two, three, four, Jeff. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> bow down. But whatever it is, I think everybody needs to be on the same page. And like Jay was saying, if you take a minute, get eyes on it. OK, I got a, a three and two walk out on that Charlie side. Make sure everybody knows. And then, you know, you you go from there and where you attack it. I don't care. That's your call. But just make sure you're clear on the delineations, you know, and if that's where the can report comes in. And I think with some of the you know, if, if you're stretching in or you're you encounter something, you need to relay that. To whoever's in charge to say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't kind of what we thought or we encountered something, you know, and, and that's where it kind of doubles back or circles back to the smaller fire ground is, is more straightforward. These big fire grounds, you, you're you not allowed that fuck up factor and or it's magnified if that happens. So you it's pretty sure you really need to delegate, get your division set up and kind of build your command structure. And it's hard when you're limited manpower, but if you take the time to do that, you're putting yourself in a better position. I think God forbid if something goes wrong mm -hmm. and things always do go wrong. You just get lucky because it's not that bad. You know, every fire is always something, something's fucked up somewhere. John, hey, no, it's it, all the same. All right. All right. Next up, uh, on location. So time, uh, I don't think time, we really have too much to talk about. It does. I mean, I'll ask, uh, does your mindset change much based on daytime, nighttime, you know, based on what you guys were saying, it's kind of like anyone could be anywhere at any time. So does your mindset change much? No, nah, for me, the time is one, obviously master the obvious last burn time, but two, just how long it takes to get things done and, and check your benchmarks, you know, and as like I said, Jay was saying, it's easy as an IC to say this, 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 but you need to be aware of how long your window is closing as that clock is ticking. And if you're not aware of that and your lag times and how long it takes, you just need to plan for that, I think, to stay ahead, you know? Yeah. Jay, Don? You know, like, I mean, I don't know if you're referencing like a time of day type deal. I mean, it um, says both. It, it says time is the influencing factor on traffic, population movement, and conditions affecting long-term incidents. So, yeah. So for for me, the only thing because there is so much work usually being done at these houses. If it's daytime, I just have to account for additional people who probably aren't usually from that area or from that home, whether it be workmen or something like that. Um, and then nighttime, people like Jeff said, delayed notification. People are going to be sleeping where they're sleeping. Um, and then also just having a good light. Like if you're doing a 360 on these homes, it is dark in a lot of these rural areas. If you don't have a good light to be able to look up and down. And then we teach it a lot with the thermal imaging cameras. Um, I've now gotten into such a habit, if it's nighttime or whatever it may be, is switching into that fire investigator mode, using that as you're going around. And that might be able to clue you in on, on, on where you're looking for. So um, especially for nighttime, you're just going to have that reduced visibility um, just trying to get around a lot, a lot of these large homes. Yeah. Um, 
So the last one's hazards, it, and I'll read the definition, but I want to hear the crazy shit, and then we'll get into the uh, case studies. Over and above initial dangers, what hazmat industrial operations are involved, will have, all right, it, there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. What are the crazy shit that you guys see with these types of structures that someone's like, holy crap, I've never heard of that before in my life? Jeff, you've been doing it for a while. Well, no, I think uh, obviously inside pools, right? Dave, uh, one of the guys was in, he couldn't see. And again, right, you can't see either the baby crawl or scooch along, but he was walking, boop, stepped right into a pool, had the pool cover, it shrink wrapped him. Good thing the guy, uh, Bradley was behind him, grabbed him and pulled him out. But it's those things that you're not necessarily, you're like, okay, I'm in a basement. You're not thinking about it. But if he was doing a quick recon, you know, maybe it turned out different, you know? So just kind of, that's cliche, but expect the unexpected. You know, we stand edge and usually hazmats for there are probably like, uh, you know, propane yeah. tanks, stuff like that. I mean, natural gas sometimes, but yeah, it's just, there's not a lot of, it, you know, solar panels, obviously that's. Well, I think you I brought think, up a good point too. Like uh, it's, it's usually propane, not natural gas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the big difference there is just, weight right natural gas yeah. can rise propane can fall in, but where is it going to be yeah you know you you think though too with some of these houses and indoor basketball courts um large almost industrial looking like gyms um that you have basements they could be anywhere really from what they have um saunas um so it really, yeah. sometimes you walk in here and, and it, it blows your mind because you'll get turned around doing a CO investigation of like, how do I yeah. get out of here? Multiple stairwells, servant quarters, servant stairwells, elevators, um, all those different things kind of add up to making it just more confusing and more yeah. difficult than just. And I, and I, yeah, I think that's it, man. It's when the wheels come off, you don't have the luxury that you do in a smaller footprint or smaller fire ground. And that, and it can happen. And like I said, things don't really make sense. We're so used to kind of checking off as we go, okay, I'm good. I'm, you know, it's just a, it's kind of like a feed, visceral feedback and things don't always make sense. And that's kind of where you're like, oh no, now what do I do? And it, it's going to get emotional real quick. And from being on the inside and getting, I've been turned around a few times and lost. And I think it's good because you're like, whew, it, it kind of, it's a, a reality check, you know, and then being on the outside, it, it's, absolutely horrible that you know what is taking so long where are these guys and just the bigger footprint complicates everything and you, your your margin for error is i think vastly decreased with with the size of these environments that we're working in you know and, yeah. and when you look at um just the disconnect that we're seeing from the the academy has to teach obviously to one standard and how it is and that's more of that right-handed left-handed search trying to stay in contact with the wall um, I'll have a room sometimes that you run into that could be seven to 800 square feet. And it's just an open room. H yeah. How are you going to be able to search that holding a wall? You have to get comfortable with whether it's a search rope, thermal imaging cameras, oriented searches, training on those. It, it is a large area search in a single family residence. And there's multiple of those throughout that house and on those floors. So those hazards that you have, there's no good safe answer of how to do it and if you there is it's probably with like six guys and you're not going to have those amount of people so those things don't let the first time you go into a fire be the time you have a trial for how you're going to do that search kind of have a plan in place of what you think would work to effectively search that area to make sure that you can say if that primary is clear you feel comfortable and confident in saying that and that's just not that's not even any like crazy of a hazard but to me, that's the worst feeling when you have to come off a wall and you're in the middle of a room trying to search or like VES, we teach VES, the, the door is probably right across the way, shut the door and you're good. Well, there might be three doors in the room and the room could be 600 square feet. And now you're trying to VES that. So it's, it's definitely more unique and challenging. Yeah, I think we'll definitely get into this a little bit. Um, I, I, fantastic points. Um Anything else? Uh, that's pretty much coal as well. So uh, before we move on to the other stuff, does anyone have any, any, probably not the three uh, 
panelists, if you will, but any questions from any of the uh, stuff that we got so far um, before we move on to the kind of case studies and discuss some of the other items? Uh, just put it there. I think not. So Jay, um, yeah. we've done a lot of the case studies. We've talked about these. And one of the things with line of duty deaths is, uh, you know, they've kind of put out a bunch of stuff. You know, there's a lot of different ones out there, but you can pick some of the McMansion ones out there and really get into some of the weeds. So you've done it. Um, and I'll let Jeff and Don kind of chime in, but you've really taken the head on this. So go ahead. Yeah. If you have the ability to put up um, I do. from the Howard County um, with yeah. firefighter Flynn. Yep. I got that. I got the uh, report right here. So let me do that. Awesome. Yeah. If you just want to throw up like a picture of that house. So two major line of duty deaths and, and we're going to put some of the links in there. There's a Can great. It now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you could see the house there on the left-hand side. It's a large 8,400 square foot uh, single family residence. So there's this fire, this happened in 2018. And then there's a very similar fire that happened in 2021 that we'll show too, which was Captain Laird out of uh, Frederick County, Maryland. Um, both of these fires occurred in, in two very large homes. Um, this one here in uh, Howard County was, like I said, 8,400 square foot, non-sprinklered. Um, and both of these were caused by uh, a lightning induced failure of the CSST, the corrugated stainless steel uh, gas lines that were coming. Which, so which, lightning I think we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, okay. I want to, I mean, before this, I didn't know anything about that. So I yeah. want to make sure everyone understands what that is because I've never heard of that before we talked about this. Sure. Do you want me to talk now about that or wait? Yeah, what is a CSST or whatever? So like you said before, a lot of these homes are not going to be near a natural gas meter or hookups. So they're having the propane tanks that are either, we see them buried or, or large tanks in the backyard. Um, the corrugated stainless steel tubing is essentially how they're running those gas lines, the propane lines throughout that house. Um, usually each line goes to a direct appliance or whatever it may be. Um, so what they're finding, and it's actually, when you read these reports, it's, it's crazy how much detail they go into. So they look at lightning strike reports, and they're able to trace back based on 911 call data, smoke detector data, and, and the strikes that are within the area, and then they can find them when they do their investigation. So a lightning strike hit in this area of this home and also the one in uh, Frederick County. It found basically uh, looking for ground. It arced through these CSST lines and it causes a very small pinhole leak. And then that propane begins coming out and basically ignites. So for both of these line of duty deaths, those were the cause um, of that fire and, and of those issues. And where so, was the propane line running? Underground. Into the and house. then when it got into the house, where was it running? It's in the ceiling level. And that's right. why. Ceiling of what? The basement. So it ended up being a basement fire. Basement fire. Yeah. And, and it creates because the ATF looks at when it's an elevated fire and the location of it, it's kind of atypical smoke patterns than what you're used to feeling or, or seeing when you open a basement door that's charged with smoke and the basement's on fire. Um, so, and that would, that's what happened with firefighter Flynn when, when they did go around, they did a full 360 and they looked into that basement. Um, the smoke layer was, was really high at ceiling level. That CSST was going through a crawl space. The crawl space was elevated. Um, and the smoke generation basically had already filled the first and the second floors. Um, like we talked about before with the fire dynamics, this house had three times the national average of air volume. So it allowed that fire to consume, and this was dimensional lumber, lumber in the basement. It was two by tens, um, and it allowed it to just burn for approximately a significant period of time um, until it finally started alerting that family through, uh, I believe their intercom system started shorting out, and that's when they woke up and smelled the smoke and called 911. Um, so the, the recognition of this was difficult because when you have these elevated, those CSST lines are usually going to be running through the ceiling level of that basement up and out to the appliances. And those are where the arcs um, and the gas was uh, basically escaping and caught on fire and began to um, deteriorate the, the dimensional lumber, which eventually caused a collapse. 
So with, with here, they, they were kind of going back and forth between checking the basement, operating on the first floor. And this also goes back to flow path. Um, when they had repositioned one of their lines, that that's showing that picture you had up there, Dan, was showing from the what they were calling the upper Charlie side, which is eventually where firefighter Flynn and their crew went back in on the second time and, and in and to the left was where he collapsed through. Um, but they were just trying to locate it. They had a difficult time. They weren't seeing any fires, just um, smoke conditions basically throughout the first and second floor. When that basement door was opened, uh, another crew had recognized seeing flames on the first floor. And now when you look at the fire dynamic simulator, it then had that unidirectional flow path of the inlet in the basement, the outlet being that door on the upper Charlie side. And that's why those flames were being seen. And that's why they repositioned and went in there to the first floor. So you could see once they made their way into the first floor, um, that fire had advanced enough. Um, and then the collapse happened and he fell into the crawl space. So the big takeaways from, from this fire um, are we'll, one. We'll, we'll put this uh, link to this uh, PDF in the chat. So anyone that wants to read the whole thing, it'll be there. Yeah, there's there's a great video too. It's about a 30 minute video that goes over it. So here's a here's the picture of that CSST line. It's It was about a six inch flame. It's like not a crazy amount of fire that's coming out of it, but it has that sustained burn time because it's basically being hidden uh, and then being fed by propane. So it's allowing it to eat away at those structural members. Mm -hmm. um, and it, with it not being identified as that basement fire and them operating uh, above it is what eventually led to the collapse of, of him falling into that hole. But it, when you look back at it and you listen and you read what they're saying, it, the, the smoke conditions were not typical of what you would think when you saw a basement fire. And that's because of those CSST lines. And if you stop at that dam, just go up a little bit. Yep. One thing too, we talk about in, um, in our tick class, it does a good example. Um, this was a uh, thick tile on top of the OSB, which is then on top of that, um, the two by tens. They were just showing through their fire dynamics um, that even on a thermal imaging camera, sometimes you're taught people like, ah, scan the floor with your tick, you'll see heat. Um, it wasn't presenting any heat for them as an indicator. You're not gonna be able to, it insulates it so well that those thermal imaging cameras are not gonna be able to pick up on it. And I, um, I think that plays a part into our 360, right? Like you have a 1200 square foot cape, but 360 is a 360. Talk about the 360s when you're talking about big mansions. Like you, have, they're so large and one area could be um, finished, one's not. Is your 360 just a 360 or are you going into that basement to actually see what's going on? Jeff, I'll, I mean, but from this and what they're saying is, is you have to get in and you have to truly, if there's any smoke in that basement, you got to, you got to right. check. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of times a 360 is almost not impossible, but man, it's, it takes a lot of effort. And that kind of comes back to circling back to, to delegating and, and making your divisions and Hey, take the Charlie side, you know, but using your camera, trying to make sure you're not stretching in over a basement fire. Um, because again, you, you know, these changes in elevations, you're jumping down off a four or five or six foot stone wall. By the time you get back around to kind of give orders to where you're going or figuring out your best access to get at this thing, um, it, it's just, it's a lot to process. So that's kind of where you got to step back and think, okay, what am I doing? And, and everybody says risk benefit. You, you kind of got to think risk consequence, right? What's the worst that can happen versus the best, I think. Um, but I don't have an answer. It's 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 a lot, and that's where a lot comes into that first in officer coming in in a car six, eight, ten minutes later is a whole different ball game than being, than being that first in engine company. You know, um, there's a lot on their plate. And and just because we're approaching on two hours, I don't want to get too much into this, but because um, I want to finish up on a couple things. But I mean, basically what happened was he he went in and fell through the floor, but it wasn't even into the basement. It was into like a upper crawl space. Crawl space. Yeah. So right. even when you went into the basement, you didn't get to him because that additional foundation was just a crawl space. It wasn't a full basement. Right. Yes. And if you if you read into how like just them being able to get him was was heroic just from where he was. And, and, right. and it was such a, a large structure in that sense. It just makes it so difficult, again, like we're saying, to, to do anything. So once it was identified that he did fall through to the basement, 
they always, the attempts in both of these line of duties was to put the ladder down the hole to try to get them to come up. I know we train and we practice on getting that hose line down and pulling them up. But if you look at the data and, and the situation, what, what happened, you are in that flow path. And that picture you, sh you saw before of um, prior to him falling and then after and the smoke difference and it basically flash over conditions on that front door, you are in the outlet of that flow path. And, and it's just not both times when they were able to get them out, they had to go to the act grade entrance for the basement yeah. in, in order to do that. Right. And it's just not the, the, and again, not looking at looking back and saying, Oh, should have, could have, would have, but get into the basement, even poke holes in the ceiling and see if you have fire. If you have, yeah. if you can't find it on the first floor, make sure it's not in the basement or in the ceiling. The, and, and you guys have seen, and Don talked about it before the construction, some of these, you know, uh, they're not even eye joists. They, they're open webbed, laminated beams yeah. basically yeah. so it could yeah. spread throughout the entire basement ceiling first floor subfloor if you will and again it, it comes back to that first those first thing questions obviously if somebody's reported trap aggressive is the way to go i'm not trying to be soft or anything but somebody you know check back i think this thing burned for an hour and i'm not throwing shade by any means but kind of reassessing hey where are we at and what are we doing here you know Typical house fire, right? You, you roll up to the front door, you throw an attic ladder right to the front door, and hopefully if somebody goes through, you stick it in. These bigger basements and things, that it's not going to happen like that. Things aren't going to pan out like you, right. you think they would. So, and, and just one thing that I picked up on this from, from doing it and then talking with uh, Paul uh, from New Canaan, they had, they had a very similar thing. If there's those lightning strikes nearby and, and this is happening, just keep in mind that CSST, I mean, there's several failures. I mean, this is just yeah. a small community we have. And these are three examples that you can hear of, of this, this starting a fire in the basement. And not only what happened in another one is, is it might not be one single hole that is on fire. There could be several arcs and several fire locations throughout that basement. So it's going to be something that you have to kind of keep in your mind. If you get a good storm rolling through some lightning strikes and then a call like this comes in, that's going to kind of make me, all right, we might have to get in that basement and check everything if we have odors or smoke or anything like that. All right. Tauble and uh, Jimble have two of those where Tauble's like, man, this this tile in the entrance is hot, you know, but th that those are all the things that you kind of cue you into be like, okay. Yeah. You know, so. So I want to touch on three kind of tactical things before we wrap up tonight. Uh, one is hose stretch planks. Someone mentioned this before, said, all right, great. We're stretching hose. We're talking about dry stretches. How long are my is my hose going to be? Do you guys run pre connects? Are you doing dry lengths? Adding on, take it from there. Two hundred and six hundred. <laughs> Got your two hundred foot cross lays or a six hundred foot long line. You know, or your two and a half for two hundred fifty right. feet. Right. I'll piggyback that. It's also knowing you know your links but sometimes houses can be deceiving and i'll, I'll throw a, a, you know an attaboy in new canaan we went there uh they took a driveway you know mcmansion they have long crosses i don't know what it was but they came up short and those you know two four guys because they run two apiece as well they added on uh to get up into an attic fire they had and I'll, i mean it's it is knowing how far you can go and then having plan b and c because you you might have be well intentioned just go for it you know you got to get in there but if oh shit we're short you know come down a, a set of stairs you know call for that extra line whether it's you know high rise pack or just uh breaking a cross lay to bring it up um because those guys made it a hell of a stop i think jeff was with us there uh that day um and it's 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 going back to you know whether it's a cape Colonial, Razor Ranch, or McMansion, it's all a box. Once that box is full, it wants to break out. So um, I think that little line offers a lot of options, but yeah. I think too, it's 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 the patience. Um, if if you can tell them to hey, let me do my 360, or and same like Don said before, the subject matter expert. If I look at that homeowner, I'm like, how do I get to your basement? And it's not through the A side, you say, hey, come around this way, and it's long. And if I could tell that nozzleman, just wait, give me 10 seconds before you just pull that cross lane and take the, the 200 foot length. And then we have to start piecemealing the line. 
And then you could just radio back to them. Hey, no, pull that. Give me 500 feet of our long line, have the pump operator break it. And then you can, then you can stretch it around just because sometimes I think we're the culture is just pull your cross leg, single fin the resonance, but 200 feet, you could eat up a hundred feet, just getting to the door, depending on where you park. So just having, having a plan in place of how you can extend or what you can do. And we just recently, within the past year or so, year or two, have a, a 600 foot combination of inch and three quarter and two and a half to give us that. And that that's like a, a, a force multiplier where we can actually, that's almost, I feel like my preferred line to pull for these homes because 200 feet just isn't going to really cut it. Yeah, and that's kind of, yeah, when you're communicating, right, when you're communicating coming in, you may have to ask in that rig to pull straight off with that with that long leg. You know what I'm saying? Versus the cross straight is right off the side. But if you're thinking that that rear mount, that long line, well, then you, you know, like you said, give the give you a few minutes to, or a few seconds to see what's up, and then plan your stretch. And uh, we talked about inch to the quarter, two and a half. Uh, you know what they're referring to is. You know, the, your first, all the lengths probably in the house are going to be the inch and three quarter. And the two and yeah. a half is just going to be kind of the feeder up to yeah. that. And that's what reduces your friction loss and, and keeps your pump discharge pressure in something that is reasonable. So it's not that you're getting more GPM out of it. You're not stretching a two and a half, but you're just getting more length for a lower uh, pump discharge pressure, basically. Um. Vertical ventilation, Jeff, you mentioned it a couple times. So you're not doing I, well. The reality is in, in that time continuum or that time frame, it's nice if it's coordinated, but a lot of times it, you'll get the stick up and you or the bucket up and you'll do it. And yeah, it's there, but and some you do need it by all means. I'm not I'm not saying vertical ventilation is, is not needed, but for your your first in tactics and usually with the, the access you're allowed. Truck placement's going to be iffy unless everybody's on the same page and the, the first in rigs are thinking, hey, leave room for the truck. You know, it's, it's a lot more in depth than just rolling up and shoot 30 feet off the side to, to you know, to, to a residence. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't have the answers for that. That's really if that truck company's on point and, and they're communicating with that engine company, guys, you're running, you're good. They're talking, coming in. You know, and the, the first in engine companies are usually telling, hey, truck, we got room for you. Or, you know, you're not going to have to back it in. You got a hard left hand turn. And, and but for construction wise, most of these are not um, going to accommodate just a portable ladder and a roof ladder, right? It depends. It, it you know, it, it, this is where you kind of get crazy because, you know, all these dormers look really cool to the eye. Um, so sometimes, depending where that fire is, you could do it, you know. Or you got to play uh, like leapfrog and go roof to roof or something. Yeah. Well, um, by then you're eating up manpower and all that exactly. stuff. Exactly, but it, but it, it depends what you're what you're 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 carrying for ladders. You know, a twenty eight is a very versatile around ladder. Thirty five, yeah, one guy can do it. it. Takes effort, but you know, so if you're carrying thirty fives and twenty eights and I don't know eighteen or sixteen foot roof ladders, maybe you'll you'll make that span. You know, if it's a truss setup, I wouldn't be you yeah. know, going up the roof, but. Right. That's that's some you, each department is going to have to figure that out for themselves, you know. Right, and then just the other thing to be realized, but back before I forget, uh, some of these places have um, it's usually like a playroom up on the second floor, uh, and there's lots of dormers and stuff. Those oh. are just e walls on steroids. That's what I would equate those things to. It's it's you know there's nice big archways and whatever. Most of the time that that's wide open. Um, it's very similar to how a cape set up with those, you know, storage on the outside walls, the knee walls. So just another thing to be mindful of. And I would assume, and someone mentioned like roof pitches, you know, even if you have the manpower and you can coordinate it, if you can't get the aerial in place, do you want someone on a, you you're know, you're not walking. No way. Right. You're not, no, it's, it's all going to, you know, it, it it's the situation is going to dictate, but most of them they're, you know, and again, that's where I think where you, everybody and everybody thinks, oh, the guy outside I see has got a handle on it. But if that's where everybody comes into play, if they see something, maybe jog the guy's memory. Hey, I don't know. We're at it 18 minutes. Or do you think right. this is a good idea? You know, because what what is your benefit or what are you looking to gain at some point? All right. Life, life 
expectancy, right? That's that's thing. But property conservation, I got it. But at some point, you need to kind of step back, and it sucks because the guys on the the rigs don't want to hear that. It's go 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 aggressive aggressive, and I get that. But you just need to remember that that continuum. I think. So the no. last thing I want to mention before I turn over to you guys for a final wrap up is the VES and search. Um, so are you, you know, crew of three, you're either doing an interior search or VES. You're probably, you're not splitting your crew and having an outside team and an inside team. So you're the truck, you know, showing up and your assignment is search. How do, and Jason, you kind of, I'll, I'll start with you because you kind of really put to this uh, earlier do you determine that? Does the chief determine that? How, how do you decide which which way you're searching? A lot of the times we've just been assigned, hey, you're doing primary searches. So it's going to be up to us. But a pro to, Yeah, right. So a primary search could be the yes. So what do you... Okay. Yeah, so if, if, if I have a known location that somebody can tell me or give me a general vicinity of where they think the family member might be, then VES might be the option that we're going to be able to do just because it could take us so long to wake our way through that home um, and, and the confusing sake of layout to get to where that bedroom might be. So if I could do a targeted search without a doubt, um, we're, we're going to try to take on and do that. And then also with that comes the the uncomfortable reality of if I hit a bedroom and, and I can look into that hallway and my conditions are okay, I might now push on to the next room next to it and just kind of keep my anchor of where that room was that I came into. I know where my ladder is. If conditions dictate, I might be able to take a wing of a home and be able to search it. Um, just because coming down that ladder, moving four windows might encompass one room. So allowing me to, to move in and, and kind of target my search a little bit better would be how I would go. Um, and then if not, and I have to go through that front door, find my stairs, um, we might not be searching from the fire location closest, but I want to get to that livable space where there's a potential for something to be um, and try to minimize wasted effort and wasted movements because I know I'm limited on my air and limited on how much, um, basically how much a guy can physically do. Are you using a search rope or no? I'll be honest with you, no. Okay. My, we just aren't. Thermal imaging cameras getting comfortable with an oriented search, working together as a team is, is really, uh, from my experiences, uh, it's always been in the back of my mind to grab one, but I mean, shame on me or whatever, but I you know. So. Yeah. I think for vent enter search, that's more targeted. So no, no, um, I agreed for vent enter search. No. Yeah. And what I would suggest to, or, or granted, I think given the guys the leeway, to make that call when they're in there. But even if, if like Jay says, he pops out. Okay. He's got a good shot down the hallway. Hey, truck command. I'm making my way down, down the hallway, Charlie side. Boom. Got it. Copy. You know, just to kind of keep tabs and by all means they're on the inside. So they have that flexibility to make that call, you know, mm -hmm. and, and do what they need to do. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a great point. Um, I think we're going to wrap up pretty much for tonight. Um, for those of you that are, uh, that joined us. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to allow these guys to uh, kind of give any closing remarks. The other thing is, you know, tonight's a seminar kind of spitballing, giving a lot of opinions back and forth. Um, but Jay is leading the charge on our actual program that we will have uh, be able to be presented to departments privately. So if you're interested in that, please let us know. Um, but I think, uh, this is definitely a topic that a lot of departments are dealing with and, and are seeing a lot of, uh, you know, expansion in terms of the construction within their cities and states or uh, towns and stuff like that. So uh, I'll let you guys kind of wrap it up with any thoughts you have. Um, but from my end, uh, I learned a lot and I appreciate you guys joining me tonight. So um, I'll start with Don. What do you got? Wrap up. Uh, I you know, I'm, I'm biased, but, uh, know your building construction. I threw in the chat, a couple of links. Uh, like I said, there's a study done about, uh, engineer lumber, how quick it burns and all that good stuff. Um, but just, just know what you're getting into. You know, you don't have to be a carpenter. You don't have to be a frame or nothing, but just kind of knowing the buildings, what, uh, might be there. Cause it's, it's, it's always changing and that's kind of the scary shit, uh, that's out there, but yeah, just know your, your building construction. Jeff. Uh, yeah, like I said, I think uh, it's good to always talk about it. But, I mean, 
a, a lot better firemen have, have died in the line of duty. I think it's good to talk about it because these are all over now. You know, I mean, I think big thing for me is your, your time continue being where you, where you are in that progression. Um, the area of these buildings are so much bigger. Granted, it's a residential, but we don't have the luxury of making mistakes that we would in a traditional smaller occupancy. And then uh, if you're IC, be thinking about water and delegating and get, staying ahead of everything, you know, and knowing your people. And I think that's it. But it's, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a good thing just to talk about it and spitball and get things out because that's how you kind of improve and get better, you know. Well, I think even you probably might fight the same fire differently in Greenwich and Wilton just based on your manpower and apparatus and that type of stuff. Yeah. I think yeah. that's very important for guys to remember is even the same fire at 3 p.m. versus 3 a.m. when you get more guys or less guys, you got to yeah. be able to adapt. 100%, you know, and there's no wrong or right answer. Well, there's a right answer if everybody right goes home safe and not, you know, God forbid something happens, but I think it's yeah. good to talk about it and just yeah throw things back and forth. Jay, what do you got? Closing remarks. Uh, I would just say um, we obviously don't go to as many fires as we want to. And there's uh, a wealth of knowledge in these line of duty death reports that um, you can you can get a lot out of. I mean, I every time I look at one and I read one, there's always good things, things that you can improve on and, and things that you can take away from. So uh, I think, Dan, you were going to send some of those uh, links out for those those two that are related to this topic. Um yeah, so That's what I'm going to what I'm going to do is uh when I post this on YouTube this video within the uh I think it's the description I'll have the links for the line duty deaths and all the stuff Don's putting up as well. So Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh thank you both all, right, all three of you very much. Um you know, I think this this is one of those seminars I was really excited for because I think it's a very uh relevant topic to especially the area that we serve. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. So thank you very much. Got it. See you. Have a good night. That's it.